Thank you, and thanks everyone for coming out tonight. It is an honor to be here. Um, I've been going around the country and speaking for about four years now, and I've seen so much as I've traveled. And I come here tonight because I have a special message for you. Um, I know that it seems like we're uh, keep we're fighting a war on so many different fronts. You know, if it's not an attack on our religious beliefs and our constitution or our values or our children, there's so much going on right now, and the uh, left wants us to feel helpless. Uh, the people that are out there trying to destroy this country want us to feel like we're fighting a battle that can't be overcome. And what I have seen since I've been traveling has been amazing. I saw when we started off in 2009 with the Tea Party and we still had groups like ACORN and Project Road out there who are still active to where we are now where these groups are basically running for cover and they're still there but they're not as uh, in your face as they were before because we had the boldness and the beauty of the Tea Party that rose up across the country. And a lot of people are like, you know, when do we get to go back to our normal lives and people have realized that this is it, this is our normal lives. You know, this is what it has become. We can no longer sit at home and let our government, you know, run amok. We can't trust them to do what is right. We have to hold them accountable each and every day. As they say, the price of uh, liberty is eternal vigilance. And that's what we're up against. And it's been beautiful to see how that has manifested itself so far. We push back against a lot of different um, intrusions into our personal lives, into our constitutional rights, and we will continue to push as we move forward in 2014. And that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today. What I have seen so far has been just amazing. We had an administration that started off with a list of things that it wanted to accomplish within the first 100 days of the administration, and that included you know, cap and trade and universal health care and card check and all of these other subversive regulations and rules, and they weren't able to because we fought back. Right now, we have an out-of-control DOJ, and IRS said it's not only terrorizing nonprofit groups, but auditing and intimidating regular citizens in order to get them to be silent. And we have said we will not be silent, we will not be quiet, we will not back down, we will not be weak or timid. We are not victims, and that is the beautiful thing about America. We have never been victims. And our next step now is to move forward, to continue to fight, and that means that we're going to have to do things that we didn't do before. Um, unfortunately, the current administration has made community organizing to be a dirty word. But if we're going to take back America, that's exactly what it's going to take. We've been demonized, we've been ostracized, we've been marginalized. They've been uh, told us that we're racist, that we're homophobic, that we're you know crazy, clinging to our guns and our Bibles. But we are the majority across the country. So you see what happens when the few try to control the many. And the only way to combat all of that is to get out there and to become even more visible than we've ever been before. And that means we're not angry. We're not against things. We are for things. We're for the Constitution. We're for equal protection under the law. We're for a DOJ that prosecutes people based on their crimes and not based on the color of their skins. I don't know how many of you guys have heard about this knockout game that they have. You know, when they're knocking out poor, innocent white people, oh my gosh, that's a tragedy. But you, they knock out one black person, and it's a hate crime. And that's how the DOJ is selectively prosecuting things. It's, ama it's, um, it's amazing what they feel that they can get away with because no one has just put it down and said, this is enough. We have got to be that voice, and not just one voice, not just two voices. We have to speak in a unified voice across the country, but we also have to get our friends and our neighbors involved. They have to know that we're not scary, we're not evil, we're not racist, we're not any of those things. And I speak about this from experience, because I, many of you have heard my story, but I tell people when I was coming up, it was Jesus and JFK in my house. We were black Catholics from the South, all of our friends were Democrats, all my mom's friends were Democrats. It was never any interaction with Republicans or conservatives or any of that. So I had this view of what you know you guys were like. And to me, it was what the left said. You were evil. I would never have anything in common with anybody like you guys, you know? You know, you were totally outside of my upbringing and my value system and all of that. And my, one of my closest friends is Catherine Engelbrecht from True the Vote. And you know how she, she's this beautiful six foot long white woman who is very much totally different from any way I was raised. And to say that she would be my friend? Oh no, 
know that's not something that would happen when I was a liberal, but it took me opening my heart and my mind and changing, changing my views and letting go of all of these preconceived notions that were put there by people that wanted to keep us divided. I tell people all the time when ACORN was fighting, they weren't fighting to end poverty or to end victimization. The money was in the fight. And as long as they, they said they were out there fighting for something, they were pulling in millions and millions of dollars. That money comes from dividing people, from keeping people angry. My grandmother always said, if you pick it a wound long enough, you will draw fresh blood. And that's what they wanted every single time, was the fresh blood of racism, of struggle, of us being separate, of hating each other, of mis uh, distrust, all of that. And that's what I've seen in this country. We are a country divided right now, and we, it's been done on purpose. And we are not fighting back the way we should. We have got to be bold. We have got to get out there. We've got to show our faces. We've got to be proud. I tell people, if, I, if there was ever a coming out party that needed to be done, we need a coming out party for conservatives. I'm just sure people say, I'm proud of you. Yes. Country. I'm proud to love my Bible. I'm proud to have values and to cherish my family. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm so tired of people making it seem like there's something wrong with us because we believe in these things. But we are not fighting back the right way. We've got to get the message out there. But it's not just about door knocking. Because we don't go out there with a message when we door knock. I tell this to candidates all the time. Don't go out there thinking you're going to be able to give them your campaign speech and everything in that first visit. That first visit is about listening. That's the only reason a lot of people ever joined ACORN. They were the first people ever to knock on those doors and to say, what do you think? What is wrong with your community? If you had a chance, what would you fix? You listen, you find out what you know, is going on in these people's heads, and you work with them. It's so simple. We have more in common than we have um, differences. But people don't want, want that to be put out there. That's not probable. That's not going to get things done. That's not going to get people like Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid to maintain power. Because it's all about power. That's exactly what we have seen in this administration. It's about amassing power to the point where you can silence your enemies, you can intimidate your enemies, you can make scandals go away. But all the scandals that have come out with Benghazi, with the IRS, with Fast and Furious, any other president would be facing high crimes and misdemeanors. But no, he's hiding behind the shield of blackness. And I am tired of that. So many people from the left have hid behind that shield for years. They would operate in black communities, and as soon as you said something about those subversive tactics, they go, oh, you're racist. You don't want black people to have a voice. You don't want black people to vote, blah, 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 whatever. I'm tired of them hiding behind blackness. We have given him a pass. And people say we've been hard on this president, but no, we've actually given him a pass. We need to demand that he be held accountable for his actions, for the actions of his staff, of his administration. We had an ambassador that was murdered and dragged through the streets in another country. At any time, when is that acceptable? At any time, when would that be acceptable? Except under the Obama administration, where it's just a bump in the road, as he, got, he liked to say. That's, it's appalling. But we as conservatives have a, a chance to unite. And that means putting together um, all of our efforts, all of our petty differences should go out the window. If AFP won't work with FreedomWorks, then don't give any money to AFP or FreedomWorks. If Tea Party Patriots won't work with so-and-so, don't give any money to either of them. Tell them that until they unite and work together, you keep your money and you give it to your candidates. The same thing with the RNC. I am so tired of the RNC thinking that it's okay of minority outreach is to put a bunch of black people in a room and take a picture. <laughs> I'm so tired of that. At what point did they stop outreaching to people and realize that outreach already denotes that there's something foreign and other and different? What we need to do is to build the base. If we build our base and open up the tent to people that, uh, that's one of the things that Andrew Barbara was working on. He wanted, you know, think about it. Him and I are not your traditional people that you would see at CPAC. 
you know, he would come up there and there would be these guys in three-piece suits and their ties and there were all these great consultants and here he comes in wrinkled jeans and a t-shirt with a backpack thrown over his shoulder. But that was the party, that was the party we were trying to make to where you can be accepted as long as you believe in what we believe. Reagan said we only need 80%, we can get the rest. When I came over, I was still uh, pro-choice. And it took someone talking to me, not in a, you know, getting in my face manner, but in a loving way, saying, hey, Anita, do me a favor. If you get a chance, I want you to watch this video. And that's all they did. And I tell you, you know, it was a couple of months later, I finally watched the video, but the video was of Margaret Sanger. And she was talking about the undesirables procreating and how she was going to use the black ministers and the black churches against us and all of this other stuff. And I had never heard of eugenics. And I'm college educated. Never heard of Margaret Sanger and all this other stuff. So it took that one video for me to get on the internet and to find out the rest of the information for myself. And once I found that out, I went from being pro-choice to being pro-life. But they already had me. And they just pulled me in with knowledge and information and love. We, we, don't, we need to um, take our message and wrap it in love. That's another thing that we're missing. We get so angry sometimes because we're right. We are very right when you think that it's just so logical that people should get this stuff. But that's just not how it works. You know, someone was talking, um, someone asked me, I was talking about my mom. It took me a couple of years to get my mom to come over because she was an Obama box. She'd kiss, kiss at his picture and talk about presidential swagger in a way that really made me uncomfortable. But <laughs> after a couple of years, she started seeing the way he was doing with the administration and she worked with the post office. So he started going after the post office and she comes to me one day and she says, you know what? And we will we'll pick up conversations where we left off, that's just how we are. And she's like, you know what? I think he's a socialist. And I knew exactly what she was talking about. I nearly fell off my chair. So this woman who had been an Obama bot two years ago was now realizing that he was subversive and a socialist. But she told me, I can't bring myself to vote for Romney or any of the other candidates. So one guy asked me, he's like, well, what's wrong with her? I said, what's wrong with us? Why is our message to the point where we can't get people that are already agreeing with us and on our side that other little percent over the line? What is wrong with our messaging that we're not reaching out the way we should? We have got to craft a message in love. We've got to craft a message and bring it down from debt ceiling and data points and sequester and blah, blah, blah to you know heart and home and families. The way the left does it, the way people do it all the time. When these groups go out there and I'm speaking tonight as myself right now, not as true the vote, because there's a certain message that I need to get to you that I can only tell you from my experiences. And I may get a little emotional, so you have to excuse me. But when I was on the left, it was all subversive. They would do things and they would try to get people to come out to rallies by saying things like, aren't you tired of these white people coming into your communities? Aren't you angry that they don't bring anything and give you anything? Aren't you mad? Don't you want to do something about it? Then they give them a lunchable and a sign and send them out there to protest in front of someone's house. That's how they did it. On our side, why can't we craft a message that talks about the facts but does it in a way that is not so lofty? Everyone out there deserves to hear this message. Everyone deserves to understand that they can either get, get, get money from the government and only be told this is what you're worth, this is what your child is worth, this is all you're ever going to get. Or be told that you can go out there and have unlimited potential to earn whatever you can do, whatever you can make. To be told that, you know, we're not racist because we want more black babies. We want you to have life. You know, there's so many things that we could do to improve our messaging. But we get so wrapped up in our consultants and our people that tell us that ads are the way to go and direct mail. If you know what happens to direct mail in the black community, it goes in the garbage. If anybody that they're going to vote for are the people that come out there and put their faces and their time and their investment in these communities. We're either going to lose America or we're going to take it back block by block. We didn't lose it that way, but that's how we're going to have to get it back. And that's something that people need to understand. I don't know how many of you have ever been out in the black community. I spent a lot of time over in Houston, over there in Sunnyside and some of the other areas. And I will tell you that it's beautiful because we have people that already know this. On election day, I was out there for the first time they implemented photo ID. And um, I was with my husband, and they automatically assumed that I was against photo ID because I was black. So I had the um, 
the Houston ACO, you come up to me and tell me, hey, I, I want you to be on the lookout for anything because we want to file a lawsuit. And I was like, got your back. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so they left, and as people were coming up that day, there was a 94-year-old man that came out, and he was on a walker, he had a nurse, and I asked him if he was ID ready. He pulled out that ID, and he held it up, and he was proud. He said, I always have my ID when I vote. I have never not voted without my ID. He was dressed nice. He took it seriously. He understood that it was a civic responsibility. And he would take the time, even though he was sick, to come down and to vote. And this was a midterm election. This wasn't a presidential election. A midterm election. So you had all these people, um, sorry, off, I'm sorry, an off-year election. You had all these people coming out there that day, and every single one of them had an ID. They were proud to show it, and, they, and this one lady, she told me, she's like, I don't understand what all the fuss is. She said, Lord, help me from all these white people that think we can't do it without them. And I just had to laugh because that's exactly what it is. It's a paternalistic idea that the... <laughs> that is pushed by certain parties, that we can't do it without them. When I see the uh, Christians and the conservatives go out there, it's totally different. And that's the message we have to bring. And it's not going to be easy. I mean, door knocking is never easy. I get out of breath sometimes when I do it. But, you know, I keep doing it because I know it makes a difference. For every person that hears my message, there's one person that might go back and take it to someone else. For every person that hears your message, there's, you know, you can get out there and do this too. We need you. If there's ever a time when we need conservatives to rise up, it is right now. I am begging you. We cannot do this without you. There are four Forces in my and yes. There are forces in place in DC right now that are coming together. Groups that have never worked before that are uniting with one message and one goal. But when we get ready, we're going to need you to trust us and to say we're ready to be your troops, we're ready to go out there on the ground, we're ready to serve. This is not for divas, this is about getting your hands dirty. When I go out there, I'm gonna have my bandana on and my jeans and my walking shoes, just like whatever candidate X or whoever from this organization or that organization. We really have got to get this done or we're going to lose our country. I want to say that one more time. We are going to lose our country. I was there on the left. I was part of these plans. I know what's coming, and I'm going to tell you, if you think it's going to get better, it's only going to get worse. They're looking at taking away our voice. They're looking at making it to where it is a crime to speak out. You already see what's happening with the IRS. If these regulations go through with the new regulations, have you guys heard about those? Yes, if these regulations go through, you're going to have nonprofits that are not on, that are not going to be able to get out there and speak. Our C4s will be handicapped, and they do a lot of our community work, our engagement work, and they're, that's a way of silencing our critics. That's a way of keeping us from doing the things we need to get done because they realize how effective these groups have been. Look at what Tea Party Patriots has done. Look at what Numbers USA, look at C uh, Freedom Works and some of these other groups that have C4s. They will no longer be able to do the work that they're doing because the IRS will silence silence them. And by silencing them, they're silencing you. They're silencing your children. They're silencing our future. Common Core, Cisco, all of these things are just ways to take our future away from us. I just got out of Maryland and I will have to tell you that my daughter's uh, grades, her test scores, her love of learning went from zero to like a thousand percent in the Katy School District. It is amazing what happens when you are under those subversive conditions and you come out of them and you don't realize what they're doing to our kids. It is sad, but we've got to be the ones that are fighting this. Even if you don't have children, you have to understand that our future is being dumbed down. They're being turned into little drones, people that just follow one behind the other. And it's scary. And that's exactly what we're facing. And I don't mean to be negative, but I feel like we only have one chance to get this message out there to let the people know. It doesn't matter about campaigns. It doesn't matter about politicians. If the heart is not, if, there, if the person doesn't have the heart and the willingness to serve, we should not elect them. And if they're in there and they're not serving the people, they're not public servants, we need to get them out. There's no reason. That's exactly what we need. And I'm going to tell you some things to look out for for 2014, because this is what we did. This is the exact playbook from 20, 2006. We were in the same situation and we wanted to take the house back. 
So what did we do as Democrats? We put minimum wage on the ballot in seven states, and we also at the same time, had, you guys remember those immigration rallies across the country? That all happened in 06. Seven states with minimum wage. In Florida, we had 71% of the total voting population. 71% turn out for a midterm election to vote for minimum wage. At the same time, who has the heart to vote against it? So many of you guys stayed home in those states and did not vote. So they not only did they vote, they went straight down the party line. And that's how you got the class of 06. Nancy Pelosi, Harry Reid, and the rest of them. That's how they took back the House. That's exactly the same strategy you're going to see. In the next couple of months, look for immigration rallies across the country. Look for these fast food workers to rise up and start protesting. The Walmart workers, they've already started this uh, last year. This is all going to happen in a domino effect. And what happens is we are always on the defensive, so we don't have a message right now. So when this happens, then we're going to be against workers. They don't want workers to have a living wage. They don't want this. They don't want these immigrants to be united, uh, reunited with their family members. We've got American citizens on one hand and people that are being shipped off back to Mexico. This is heartbreaking. They're going to write this narrative so clear as, uh, as I'm telling you right now. And we're not going to be able to respond to it. So we need to come up with responses now for what happens when they propose a living wage, not a minimum wage, for a living wage. What happens when they propose amnesty again? These are the things that we're going to be looking at. This is the uphill battle for 2014, and we have got to get ready for it, guys. I'm telling you now, this is the playbook, and it works so well because we don't know how to respond. And if you're always on the defensive and you're always against something, it's so much easier to be for something. So all the people that are for it are going to sound louder. And then there was a message that was decoded from Occupy, and they are coming back. And instead of being a stationary movement, you know, occupying Zuccotti Park or whatever park, they're going to be rotating, disrupting financial systems and institutions throughout the spring of 2014. So mark my words, between Occupy, the uh, immigration rallies, and the minimum wage, living wage rallies, we're going to have our hands full. So we need to start thinking about strategies now.